Many of Russia's missiles cost $10 million each, and they've launched over a thousand of them. Add destroyed military hardware, soldiers' salaries, and sanctions, and the cost is immense. Some officials quietly argue that we shouldn't negotiate a quick end to the war because weakening Putin is more important. Thousands of lives could be needlessly sacrificed while we avoid a more reliable way to bring Putin down. We'll also share remarkable stories from Ukraine and see what Russians think of Zelensky. While the EU is sending a billion euros to help Ukraine, it sent Russia a hundred billion euros last year for energy supplies. We're fueling Putin's war machine and keeping him in power with enormous wealth to cement his regime. When Russian forces massed on the Ukrainian border, oil prices rose from $75 to $100 a barrel. And as Putin's army began leveling towns, prices rose to over $110. Even oil company executives found it sickening, one noting that Western democracies finance a battle tank every 20 minutes. Ukraine claims to have destroyed around 500 Russian tanks, 118 helicopters, 96 aircraft and three boats, billions of dollars worth of hardware. And NATO hopes the war will ultimately prove too expensive for Russia. The wars in Iraq and Afghanistan cost the U.S. trillions of dollars, leaving it weaker and poorer. And Putin faces an even greater challenge. The U.S. economy is 14 times larger than Russia's, and Ukraine is much more powerful than Iraq or Afghanistan. $200,000 missiles are destroying $8 million Russian tanks. The first time I uh, held this thing, it was two weeks ago, I was assigned uh, to this unit to fight the, the tanks. So it blast uh, over the uh, top of the tank, where the armor is the weakest point, and fires through the whole thing. It could even in, in ignite the whole battle ammunition that is inside the tank. 40% of Russia's government revenue comes from oil and gas. And if those financial pipelines dried up, it would have to raise taxes, a more reliable way to undermine Putin's support than war, which often increases support for leaders. Putin needs that oil money to fuel his war machine and his own political survival. So, can we cut it off? Most of Russia's oil and gas is sold to Europe, where it's mainly used for transport and heating. There are plans to reduce it by two-thirds in a year, but that would allow Russia time to find new buyers, and it's certainly not fast enough for those under siege in Ukraine. I don't know when you will see this video, if I am alive or not, because uh, our life is uh, not safe every minute. The last 12 days we live, no, we survive without electricity, with no water, no gas, no mobile connection. Experts warn that the only way to quickly cut off Putin's money is to cut our use of oil and gas. And it would also cut fuel prices. During the pandemic, the price of oil dropped below zero, with suppliers worried that storage space would run out. Instead of subsidizing energy, which drives up the price and use of oil, governments should take steps to cut demand. The International Energy Agency has shown how this could be done with cheaper public transport, car-free Sundays and working from home three days a week. If we really want to disable Putin's war machine, one of the biggest ways to cut demand would be a one-in-two-day driving ban, a rideshare app 
free public transport and e-bike rentals could help fill the gap. The measures would of course be temporary and would cancel some of the 300,000 annual deaths in Europe from air pollution. Limiting fuel use was crucial during World War II. Private motorists can help by exercising restraint over and above the limitations imposed by petrol rationing. Eager business types become pedal pushers. If you're a top executive, travel in style. Seriously, however, public transport, in spite of cuts, can still absorb a lot of private travel. There must be thousands who could use it instead of their private car during this real emergency. But today, the lack of government efforts to cut demand is silently devastating. Recently, the top article on Medium was titled Putin has already won, pointing out that we're unwilling to sacrifice oil consumption to stop him. And China is watching. If Putin flattens Ukraine, perhaps even taking part of the country without a crippling financial penalty, the gates to war will remain open. China does far more business with the West than with Russia, and it will calculate the potential cost of conflict. There is also a dangerous lack of international efforts for mediated talks. Sun Tzu said, build your opponent a golden bridge to retreat across. The chances of Putin being removed are slim, while his power rests on oil money more than public support. С народом это, я считаю, достойное уважение, потому что обычно, когда начинается власть, она уезжает из страны максимально. Украина стала частью России? Конечно нет. Я что кто-то может захотеть. Нет. Почему? Ну, а зачем? Это другой, другой, другой государство. Хотел бы, чтобы Украина всегда была независимой. Нет. Почему? Это хочет один человек. <laughs> Все. Russian cosmonauts even arrived at the ISS in Ukrainian colors. When asked about it, they said they had a lot of spare yellow fabric and needed to use it. Researchers found that Russian officials are paid $67 billion in bribes every year, sidelining public opinion and resistance from Russian troops. The second financial force driving the war is direct profit. The Afghanistan war boosted the pay of Lockheed Martin CEO from $2 million to over $30 million. And the company's shares are soaring again, lifting the wealth of shareholders, including US members of Congress, who own millions of dollars of stock in defense companies. And the incentive to keep the war going is compounded by the risk of losing votes over any measures to cut oil consumption. In the US, hundreds of government officials and military officers are hired by defense companies every year, and around 90% become lobbyists, used to influence the government. The same tactic is used in Europe, and defense companies also simply buy influence through political donations. Public pressure needs to counter private interests. Can the incredible courage of Ukrainians inspire us to take action? Doctors are working to save people even as hospitals are repeatedly fired upon. And in this basement, nurses are caring for 20 babies born to surrogate mothers awaiting their parents from the US and Europe. 
Ludmilla says the hardest part is the small enclosed space and the constant threat of explosions. But the babies still need to be fed, taken care of and loved. And this team of former British soldiers rescued 120 animals from a shelter that was hit by airstrikes. We're reuniting people with animals that have lost their husbands, lost their children, lost their house. This vet is helping animals trapped in the conflict. And this man is moving what looks like an anti-tank mine. While we were talking to someone in Ukraine, their city was attacked, and we asked them to pass on some money to people who needed it. They found some remarkable people. The rest of the money from our sponsor, DataCamp, will go to the Disasters Emergency Committee. DataCamp is a great place to get into AI or learn a programming language. There are over 350 data science courses. You could learn Python, which is free to use, easy to get into, and one of the most popular languages for developing AI. It's the Swiss army knife of languages and can do almost anything from creating beautiful infographics and presentations to programming robots. You'll learn by experimenting with code and you'll get instant feedback. It could kick off a new career or take your skills up a level. You can use our link in the description to try the first chapter of any course for free. Thank you.